Can people hear me in the back? OK, yeah. Good evening, everybody. I'd like to uh, welcome you on behalf of my colleagues of IBEC Global and IBEC to our offices here tonight. Um, our offices have become house of Irish businesses and Irish connections. Um, IBEC Global is the international business division of IBEC, and um, we aim to connect government, businesses, civil servants um, to address the most uh, pressing issues for today um, across society and, and, and our economy. Uh, recent events actually have learned um, that one of the most important things, and certainly in the history of IBEC, is actually the relationship between peace and prosperity. And that is why we are um, very much a supporter of the Pat and the, Hume, uh, the John and Pat Hume Foundation. We're very glad and very supportive that we can do this for you tonight. James, thank you so much for you and your team for all the great work that you uh, that you do. Commissioner McGuinness, thank you so much for your leadership and joining us tonight. I'd like to welcome you all and wish you a pleasant evening. I'm very much looking forward to your address tonight, Commissioner McGuinness, and the conversation that you're going to have with Tony Connolly after. I wish you a pleasant evening. Um, I, I won't use the mic. Everyone can hear me. Yes, yes. A deep voice. It's good. <laughs> uh, my name is Paul Arthur. I'm uh, on the board of the John Pat Hume Foundation. Uh, this is the third in a series of lectures in the spirit of peace. The first was uh, given by David Sullivan. I think Tony, you shared that. It's my mind. That's right. Yeah. yeah. And Professor Bridget Laughton did it uh, last year. So you can see. We've got very distinguished company, and we're delighted that Commissioner McGuinness is here with us tonight. Um, just on the John and Pat Hume Foundation, when John retired from Europe, the first role he took on was he was the Tip O'Neill Chair in Peace Studies at McGee at the University of Ulster. And he organised a wonderful series of lectures from, you know, presidents of the United States to Kofi Annan to a very strong European contingent. And the first lecture that I remember was done by uh, Romano Prodi. Uh, and his his topic was the EU and peace. And that was 2004. And he did say that as far as he was concerned, the most important thing about the EU was the fostering and flourishing of peace. And in his lecture, he quoted from um, Immanuel Kant and the notion of perpetual peace. But he also quoted from uh, Thomas Hobbes on Leviathan and the state of nature. And I say that's because of the times we live in now, that we are in a very bad situation and the rule of Europe is needed more than most. So I hope that the spirit of peace lecture <coughs> allows us to carry on that sort of conversation as we try and move in a positive direction. And so can I hand over? Very much, Paul. Uh, it's a great pleasure once again to host and moderate this uh, John Hume Spirit of Peace, European Spirit of Peace uh, event. This is the third event uh, since the inception of this uh, program. And as a dairyman, and as someone who stuffed um, em envelopes for John Hume in the 1970s and put them through letterboxes in my neighbourhood, I feel uh, somewhat qualified to be here this evening. So it's a great pleasure. And it's a great pleasure to be introducing Maria McGuinness, uh, the Com European Commissioner for Financial Stability, Financial Services and Capital Markets Union. Uh, Maria has had a stellar European political career uh, and also a stellar media career in Ireland uh, with the Late Late Show and Ear to the Ground. And she moved into politics uh, in 2004, I think, as MEP. <coughs> she has been uh, first vice president, of course, of the European Parliament from uh, 2017 to 2020. She was MEP for East from 2004 to 2014 and for Midlands Northwest from uh, 2014 to 2020. So she's Ireland's longest serving uh, MEP. Maria was the first female graduate, believe it or not, of uh, UCD's Bachelor of Science degree uh, in Agricultural Economics. 
uh, and in 1984, before joining uh, RTE, she completed a diploma in accounting and finance. Uh, in 2014, Maria McGuinness was awarded the UCD Alumnus of the Year uh, for Agriculture and Food Science. In 2011, uh, she announced her uh, candidacy to be the nominee for Fine Gael for the uh, presidential election in Ireland. Uh, she was unsuccessful on that occasion, but uh, speculation has followed her around. Her. <laughs> 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 she's going to reveal her plans. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Maria McGuinness, uh, Ireland's Commissioner for the European Union. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> and it's really lovely to be here. Um, look, you're a dairy man, so I'm a pretender. I'm a loud woman. And you've been much closer to John Hume. And actually, isn't it lovely to be able to say that you stuffed envelopes for a man who brought peace to the island of Ireland? I think that's I just always treasure that thought. Uh, and the truth be told, I actually feel that um, John Hume has haunted me in the sense that in the 60s uh, and 70s, you know, I lived near the border. So in RD, we, you were more aware of the tensions and what was happening. And even as a young person, it troubled me greatly what was happening. And I felt even though we weren't doing enough, if, if I think some of the audience will understand that. Um, and I, I, I've, I've read this book. Have you, have you read it? And I've, as you can see, what I did in the beginning, and I ran out of sticky leaflets, was I actually, it brought me through the horrors because it was through all of the bad times and the civil rights protests and the peaceful protests. Um, and then it goes right to the end and I'll, I'll weave in some of my reflections on what's in that book. So I feel very unqualified to give this uh, lecture, but I feel very honored that I've been asked to do it. And when John Hume passed away, uh, my four children were not troubled by the troubles, thankfully. That ended before uh, they would become aware of any of those types of things. But I made those replicas in the house work. And we spoke. And I wrote to Pat afterwards. And I got a lovely letter back. And it, I was motivated because I thought, I want this man to be remembered and, and never forgotten. Um, and, you know, it wasn't all a perfectly pass or a smooth pass towards peace. It, it was twists and turns and traumas. And the politics, rather, of it were very, very difficult. But my God, aren't we, you know, honoured that we had a man called John. He showed in his early days his passion for social justice and for the well-being of people, that it wasn't about flags and emblems. It was about how can you make life better for the people that you serve. Um, and as I say, I recall all of those pictures on television and they were black and white at the time. And I'm so grateful that he did, um, as a persuader and as a very patient and persistent persuader, stick with his passion for peace, despite the many dark days. And I think we might overlook that part of the reality uh, if we don't speak about it again. Because I've spent almost 20 years here in Brussels uh, working for firstly in the Parliament and, and now in the Commission, I've really got a huge appreciation for John as a member of the European Parliament. Um, and his passion for the Parliament, he could speak better French than I ever hoped to do, which I thought was also a great plus for him. And I think when we reflect on his path towards politics, his uh, being in Manus for a period of time, his social awareness and how that grew, um, you can see that everything he did from his earliest days were, were pushing him in the direction of being a builder of peace and looking after people um, more so than looking after uh, emblems or flags. And of course, we include Pat in the conversation and the children, because one of the things I reflect from this book is it was actually a family affair. Um, that John could do what he did because his family were with him all the way. And in fact, I think they just took it as part of their natural work as the household that John was engaged in, you know, many phone calls coming in for many different uh, names, some well-known, some not so well-known. They also lived with the horrors because they too were threatened uh, because they were John's family uh, in the darker days. So I just want to reflect maybe briefly on John's time in Europe. Maybe also to look at the challenges Europe faces today and, and also to reflect on what John might do in these times that are less certain and more difficult as the whole geopolitical landscape is changing. 
I mean, every dairy man is a proud dairy man. I think that goes to say, and we have one here beside us. So I won't say that John Hume was a proud, but he was also a great dairy man, a great Irish man, and particularly a great European. And I would that we would have more of his type of voices in the parliament, because sometimes you get bedded down in amendments and resolutions and catching each other out on a vote, when in fact, Europe is about something much, much bigger. And John knew that. And over the 25 years, he worked on the bigger picture. And when he passed away, and many will know this, the tributes didn't just flow in from Northern Ireland or the UK or the Republic of Ireland, but it was Brussels. And it was beyond as well, particularly to the United States, because everyone who knew him knew what he had done and what he had achieved and were there to support him in that journey. But the roots of his, if you like, life and his passion for people were in the credit union uh, movement. And he became president of the Irish League of Credit Unions at just 27. And I suppose because my late father would have been involved in the credit union in RD, I kind of think that people, um, there are people like John who go further and there are others who do their small piece of work, but it's very valuable because the credit unions helped empower people who didn't have access to money. And they allowed for people to get access to small amounts of money that made a huge difference to them. So John was rooted in good soil. That's my agriculture coming out. And I, I particularly liked what he did around civil rights and that movement. And, you know, we forget how, what it was like, that there were not, there was not equality in Northern Ireland. And that access to housing was a huge issue for some parts of the community. Access to jobs was a major issue. And he wanted to work with the community, particularly his local community, to improve all of these things and to support their better living conditions, which was absolutely essential. But then you marry the local with the European. Uh, and he was so committed to the whole European endeavour. As I said, it spanned 25 years. Um, I lasted 16. And, you know, I know what it's like in terms of the rough and tumble of uh, John's uh, involvement. But I would also add, and maybe we can reflect on this, that John worked in Northern Ireland. He was an MP and he was an MEP. You couldn't do that today. But actually, that's how he achieved so much, because he had so many people that he could access. And it's something we might need to think about again as to the demarcation of roles, because John's career in politics um, saw him work across different levels and have access to influence and people who could help him in the process. Um, he left as I was just starting, would that I'd had even a moment of a crossover, um, but that wasn't to happen. Um, he got elected in 1979. These were the first directly elected MEPs. Um, and I would imagine that his movement between Brussels and Strasbourg and home and, and London or whatever, but particularly coming to Europe was, I was going to say an escape, but maybe also a retreat um, of sorts from the daily troubles in Northern Ireland. But of course, he didn't leave them behind. He brought them with him uh, when he was in the, the parliament. And it's been really nice for me to talk to some members, and there are still a few who would have worked with John, who would recall his passionate speeches, um, and, and, you know, he was a man of few and important words and he repeated them often. And, you know, that's no harm um, because sometimes you need to repeat things for the message. It also, in my view, marks him as a man of consistency. He knew what he wanted to do. He just wasn't sure how we get there, but he was going to use every possible lever to make sure that he achieved the objective of bringing peace. And I often wonder in the darker moments, was he troubled by maybe I won't achieve this? before my day is over. And I'm so glad that he did because he put so much into it. And you know that he regarded the European Union as the greatest example in the history of the world of conflict resolution, uh, particularly as he was standing on that bridge between Strasbourg and Kiel, linking France and Germany. Um, and you know, we've had very nice introductory remarks here about the state of the world today and the need for a spirit of peace and a need to rethink how in the darkest of times where we feel sometimes a little bit powerless, how Europe has enormous strength and experience in this area to bring to the table um, because we are about peace. And maybe tonight is a moment where we should reflect on that that is the core of our work and everything we do should be around how to we strengthen peace internally in Europe, because there are there's strife. I mean, it's not violent, but it, there are you know many struggles within Europe today. And we could do well to reflect on John's 
persistent, patient, persuasive approach. Respect for difference was important to him. He spoke about an accident of birth. I kind of identify with that. Sometimes I think I am the great pretender. I was from a small, I am from a small farm in Ardian County, Louth. I didn't know anything really about politics or journalism, but I had an aspiration to try both at some stage in my life. And the Ireland of my time allowed me to do that. And then it allowed me to be here. And um, I don't know how these things happen. Maybe I helped along in some way. But I sometimes think, like for John, that people like John are given, I suppose, a responsibility. And some people try and evade it and others just embrace it and take on with it. And so uh, glad we are that he did that. And I do want to mention Pat Hume again and the family. I mean, I think when I read, uh, particularly in the book about uh, the toing and froing in that household, I mean, I don't know how Pat prevailed. How she was, you know, consistently calm, supportive, engaged. She was the person who ran the constituency office. And in a way, they were a fantastic team. And we were talking earlier in a debate in the parliament about, you know, um, e gender equality and, and the role of women and visibility. And if ever there was, um, you know, a good story around how there was teamwork that was, I presume, not agreed by a signing of a signature, but an understanding between them of what was necessary in order for good work to be done. I think it was between John and Pat. And of course, the Northern Ireland Women's um, Coalition is particularly relevant here, too, because it was formed in uh, 1996 as a cross community party and took part in the peace talks because it wanted to make sure, and I think rightly so, that local communities felt reflected in the talks. In other words, that they had skin in the game of what was going on. And it wasn't just about a distant political process. When John accepted the Nobel Peace Prize, he declared that we owe this peace to the ordinary people, both north and south of the border. And you know, John was a very ordinary person but he did extraordinary things. And I think ordinary people have that capacity um, once they find others who will help them and work with them. And many of those ordinary men and women worked tirelessly to build support for peace in their households, in their villages, towns, and their wider community. And we probably don't know all of their names, but it is thanks to many of them that we are celebrating and marking a 25 year milestone for peace. Those who worked on, who indeed still work tirelessly at the grassroots uh, with the people directly affected by violence and instability. Um, and they worked across physical borders, but also borders of the mind. And they're the hardest ones to actually see and to, if you like, take down. And while we do mark 25 years of peace and um, profound, with profound gratitude, I think we also realize that we have a lot of work to do still, that, that peace is always fragile unless it's worked on, uh, that nothing stands still. I mentioned earlier in my reference to gender equality in the parliament that there is an idea that progress is inevitable and straightforward. And frankly, I think the way the world is today, we realize that it is not a given that we will make progress on many of these issues that we hold dearly today. And it is often likely that they slip backwards unless there are people really, really engaged and committed to stabilizing progress and pushing forward. So if we look to where we are today, you know, John, three years, his passing, and we recall that with great sadness. Uh, the international landscape is, is much more uncertain and increasingly very difficult. We have this terrible conflict between Israel and Hamas, and there is real concern about could this spread further? Um, wider regional conflict. We're looking at the role of Iran and other, I suppose, uh, actors in that area. Um, we also had the illegal and still have because it's 600 days of war we have in Ukraine. And sometimes one horror replaces another, but we have to think of them all together. And we reflect on the terrible human suffering that war brings, no matter where the war is. Uh, and of course, the consequences rip, ripple right across communities and the world. And of course, before that, we also had COVID and, and Brexit. But when you look at COVID and the, the impact it had in terms of how people live, work and play, and, and there's still a legacy impact on all of that in our communities and in our society. So this idea of the way the geopolitical landscape is shifting is alarming. 
We see you know, even in trade patterns um, and financial flows, they're shifting. Uh, other countries are emerging and they have, I suppose, ambitions to assert themselves much more. Uh, we know that our relationship with China is now based on um, de-risking and not decoupling because we don't want to cut ties. But I do think that we have um, perhaps lost some of our naivety in the European Union, possibly because of the uh, consequences of COVID and then the, the Russian invasion. In terms of we do need to look at our open strategic autonomy and make sure that we are not vulnerable in certain areas, including in energy, which we were extremely vulnerable on. So we have a lot of work to do uh, to um, bring us forward towards this more sustainable and indeed equal um, society that there is still uh, work to be completed on. I mentioned Brexit because we have moved a great deal forward. I'm not sure what John would have thought if you were able to give us his, his reflections on Brexit. But I mean, I was heartbroken because we were losing many great colleagues uh, in the European Parliament. And I knew that it would mean a sundering. It would be very hard to get us back on a level path, if you like. But good work has happened. And we are definitely in a much better place with the Windsor framework. But there too, we will need to find the space and place to keep the relationship between the European Union and the United Kingdom strong, because on issues of violence, of war, we share the same concerns, our sanctions on uh, Russia and Belarus, we share those. Uh, but I'm even thinking of the issues around pollution like Loch Ness. I mean, this is a part of a, a big story at the moment where we do need to work in a collaborative way um, on the environmental side as much on, on, as on the peace building side. So if you look at today's world, I think we can draw lessons from John Hume uh, and the spirit uh, that, that was there in 1998. And people who were part of that, it might have been easier to say, no, we haven't got enough or to walk away as some chose to do. But brave people stuck with it. Um, and they, they jumped outside their comfort zone to some extent. I, sometimes when I read the bits, but they were very hungry on occasion. They were probably very hangry as well, so that they have to, had to be fed. And I think of Momolam and I think of the personalities of some of those people mattered hugely. Not so much their degrees or qualifications, but their way of dealing with people. And I suppose my own reflections on the European Parliament, when people say, like, what's it like and is it difficult? I say it's like a parents association. It's just bigger. <laughs> engagements, or in, in our case, the GAA. <laughs> but getting on with people. And that is the most difficult skill of all. And John, you know, even I'd say when he was annoying people, he got on with them because they realized his heart was in the right place. Um, so, so I love re, um, reading what happened. And I actually love the idea that people took risks because what was happening in Northern Ireland was just appalling and it went on for far too long. Um, and also that John hadn't just started in the 90s. His work began way, way earlier and he knew that it might take time and he literally stuck with it until the very bitter but happily the very fruitful end because he did start talking to Gerry Adams in the 80s and of course was heavily criticised indeed in newspapers and elsewhere for doing that. And, and sometimes that's part of maybe, you know, he felt and could take that. Although when I reflect again on what's written, it was very difficult for him. And maybe that's another part of his story and the spirit of peace that it can be a very lonely place when you're trying to do something that you believe is right. It can be very, very hurtful for your family. You are part of and feel your pain when somebody is criticizing you. And there was a lot of that. And I think we should maybe just reflect on that, that it was a lonely journey on many occasions. And I really, I mean, I don't know how we kept going some of the times in the really bad moments, but he shed a tear in public. And I always think that was a great thing to be able to do, that a man in particular could embrace and, and shed a tear because sometimes there's nothing else that you can do because words are, are really not good enough. Um, David Tremble is also very important because in many ways he did the same. Uh, he took that big leap of faith and risk and, 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 you know, but for all of that, we wouldn't have the peace that we have. And leadership matters. Um, it's very easy to lead people into a, a frenzy. And we see a lot of that today. It's very hard 
to lead people through reason and logic and calm. And we could do with an awful lot more of that today than we have. I think we also need to talk about courage, political courage. I mean, in a small way, I had an exchange with some environmental organisations today. And, you know, there's great hope that the renewable sector will get us away from dirty fossil fuel. But actually, even in the story of renewables, we have hard choices to make here. And maybe we also need in, in our discussion about sustainability and climate, etc. Be courageous to tell people that this path is tough rather than straightforward. Um, and maybe that is a hard message to reflect on, but I think it does require strong political leadership uh, on, on that topic. Uh, leadership similar to what John Hume would have brought to the table. I'm going to zip through this and maybe reflect on where we are today. October the 7th, uh, what Hamas did uh, in Israel and to men, women and children is actually one of the worst horrors if you can compare hers, it was brutal. It was a terrible terrorist attack on, on people. I mean, I, I think particularly of those at the music festival. And I mean, you can't imagine what they've all gone through and the taking of hostages. And I think we really need to say that all hostages have to be released immediately. I also share the concerns, and I'm sure there are many in this room, over the escalating situation and, and reflect that international and humanitarian law prohibits the forcible transfer of population and collective uh, punishment. And of course, Israel has a right to self-defense. Israel has an obligation to comply with international law. And I note also that yesterday, Ireland and, and some other member states stressed the need for a humanitarian pause. And I think we all know that that is what is needed because we've already I mean, at this stage, the numbers are very large of those killed in Gaza, including uh, 2,000 children. At least that is the figure that I have here. And then to peace, because there are times like now you wonder how on earth can peace ever come from these sort of, of horrors? And, and the European Union, I think, has and will continue to say, um, as Ireland does, that we are committed to a two-state solution, that there's no military solution to achieve this. Only a political process can achieve uh, lasting peace and a two-state solution. And I think somebody from the UN used the words, so I'll just repeat them. As absurd as it might seem right now, because it does seem absurd to talk about uh, an evolving, a situation evolving towards peace, I think now is the very time that all of us have to multiply our efforts to achieve a lasting peace in the region. Um, as a peace project itself, as John Hume recognised, the EU could and has to play a really important role. And if we take another lesson from John, it is to redouble all of our efforts to find that just and lasting peace, because the status quo of injustice uh, and war is just not tenable. Um, and again, I would remind us all of the importance of uh, women in conflict resolution, uh, from Pat Hume to the Northern Ireland Women's Coalition, I think of the Women Wage Peace, which is a grassroots movement in Israel for peace. And they've previously reached out to women's groups in Northern Ireland to learn from the peace process, including Monica McWilliams of the Women's Coalition. And now they're mourning those who are killed by Hamas. And they're worried for the safety of those missing, those hostages I mentioned, including Vivian Silver, a peace activist in their own organization. So I think we all need to remember the pain that, that's happening in the hearts of those impacted. And yet their statement in response to the attacks did not seek retribution. In their words, one cannot resolve one injustice with another injustice. It takes a very big heart to say that and to live that. Um, I'm not sure if, if any of us were so challenged that we would have that within us. Because what they're doing is trying to build bridges with Palestinian women in Gaza, to try and build bridges that were not different. In fact, we share um, a lot of things in common. Um, and they note the lack of women in decision-making forums in Israel, in the forums where peace could be built. I take from this uh, that there are, even in the darkest moments, and we've all had them, there's signs of hope. And I think the Department of Foreign Affairs, in the worst days of trying to navigate the peace agreement, they had this mantra, we have the duty of hope. 
So it wasn't a choice, but people had that duty of hope. And I think we all have to keep that in our own hearts, uh, whatever our role is. Um, I think before I, I, I wind up, I was almost tempted to ask you all to stand up and sing um, the town that I love so well, but maybe <laughs> we'll do that at the end, <laughs> the end of the exhibition. <laughs> Any boy, you know, all of those things. Because the Irish have a great capacity for a sing song. And actually, let's not lose it. And when I was a journalist and I was in the Guild of Agricultural Journalists, I mean, I'm not a great singer, but boy, did I love a sing song. <laughs> and I don't know where I got the words from, from any songs that were not very old, like Believe Me of All Those Endearing Young Charms, etc. Hands up those who know that. <laughs> oh my God, you're too young. Anyway, you were joining the chorus. Um, I would often, when we were away <laughs> in South America with a, a delegation from the Agriculture Committee, and I started singing and there was this like, God, imagine saying it. And they all joined in and they realised, you know what, it was a bit of fun. So I'd say what saved John was actually a bit of that joy that singing brought. I particularly love the story of Bono and how that was um, the big bringing together of John and David um, at that concert. I mean, when you realise what went on, the thought of that, I just think, wasn't that amazing? That you could do that and... I suppose, raise the issue of uh, the referendum to a much higher level and bring people on the journey. So for somebody from RDN County Louds, um, who actually feels that they knew John Hume because we saw him and we were so proud of him and we wanted him to succeed for all of our sakes. Having read this book, which I would actually recommend, for all the sadness and joy that's in it, um, I'm sure his family felt a bit sad that in the end he would lose his memory of these things. Well, I think, and maybe I will go to where I, yeah, Mark Durkham, his famous remark, what John could no longer remember, we should never forget. Thank you. Water. It's the least I could do is pour the drinks. <laughs> Thank you very much, Commissioner McGuinness. I um, wanted to start by reflecting on the the time that has elapsed since the, the, the darkest days of the Troubles. Many of us may have seen uh, Once Upon a Time in Northern Ireland. Uh, I watched some of that during the summer in Derry and uh, it just brought back how horrendous the the worst days of the Troubles were. RD, I know very well from it being on the Dublin to Derry bus <laughs> when I was a student, um, uh, before you put it on the map, obviously. Uh, <laughs> Not far from the border, do you have any personal memories of growing up and being jolted by what was happening uh, across the border? And of course, in, in Monaghan and Dublin as well, let's not forget. I think I was jolted all the time. And that's why I reflect on the difference of my children in terms of their, just their experience. Ours was, we lived through the horrors. But we weren't involved. I mean, we were near, but we were very far away at the same time. And somewhere in my mind, when I look back, and I'm old now, I, I do I do think I had a sense that why weren't people doing more to stop it? I had that sense of every bombing. And one of the things I did, you know, on reading this book, these are actually bombings or murders. Or, and in the, I actually ran out of, you know, labels to put it on. So, I mean, if, if I were to reflect on any particular one, and I don't think there are particular ones because every uh, murder was a horrific murder. Um, yeah, when people are blown up and nobody was warned, I mean, even at the weekend, Mary McCallaghan had a reflection with the family of the bride, yes, whose wife was blown up in her father's chip shop. Priselli's, I think. Prisel, and he had a daughter that was two. I actually, I mean, I, your heart would break when you hear those stories. And his interview was 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 incredible because he's actually working for peace. So you'd imagine that those um, people who were affected personally would actually turn against and be angry. Some maybe did, but I think a lot of people, maybe deep down for some 
I suppose, comfort for themselves, actually decided to channel that energy in a positive way and to try and build peace. But honestly, would, would I do that? I don't know if I would have the the courage to to say I bury a loved one that was murdered by you and I'm going to try and reach out to you. And the truth is that there will be no peace unless that happens. And that's why I think John took great risks in reaching out um, and got great abuse for doing it because people thought it wasn't the right thing to do. He had no idea whether it would work or not. I mean, I think when you look at the journey um, of how he got there, but in the end, there was enough people who had faith in him and his capacity to, to motivate and move people forward um, and that they worked with him and helped. But he carried a lot of it himself. I mean, he carried a lot of the weight himself. So I deviated from your question. I just remember there were dark days. Um, I mean, I even for some reason, John Taylor's shooting. I have no idea why that went, but I remember you shot in the face or something. I don't want it. I mean. I mean, and John Taylor has been kind of difficult on many things, but nobody would wish that on him. I mean, the London and Dublin bombings, of course, I think anyone who was there would remember those uh, for the horrors. And and maybe it was a wake up call to us who were so near and yet so far from what was happening in Northern Ireland. But I think what struck me most was you could see the deprivation in the communities that John was trying to help through the credit union and uh, through looking for better housing. Um, that to me was, you know, that that is what triggered in the end where we went um, and without doing any deep analysis on it. I was very conscious of that. Um, and I sometimes wonder, is that why I was interested in politics? Or I was just very aware of who was saying what, why they were saying it. I could probably understand it, but I, it, it bothered me as a growing up that it was so close to us. I mean, the town of Dundalk was really decimated by the troubles, so I mean, it, and now it's thriving and it is a great college and, and lots of industry. So I suppose that in a meandering kind of way, um, I need to dig out my box of books that I would probably have written stuff on and I will, I have a lot of boxes of things, uh, to see, you know, where did it impact? For maybe anyone of my age, we were affected by it without really putting words on it because it was happening in Ireland and on our soil. And yet part of me felt it wasn't happening in our, you know, it was somewhere else. Um, and maybe to reflect on where we are now. I mean, John talked about not so much um, a united Ireland, but a united island. And I think those are kind of quite profound thoughts when, when people say, when's it going to happen? Or there's a flippancy now about what's next, as opposed to embedding what we have today. I mean, I suppose what I'm, what I'm getting at is, is there's a lot of commentary about the fact that, you know, a generation or two has grown up without any real sense or understanding of the, the horrors of the conflict. And, and this has all led into the debate about certain songs that are sung uh, and the, the wolf tones and kind of relativizing um, the, the, the past. Um, and of course, we are looking at the, the, the likely scenario of, of Sinn Féin being in, in the next uh, Irish government. Um, I mean, it's, it's probably a good thing in a way that, that people have moved on. Um, but do, do you have any thought, do you have any concerns about that sense of relativizing uh, what happened? I would be concerned that if you don't study history, that you know nothing. I mean, that's a real worry. I think that in, in our schools, um, if you have somebody who talks to you about it at home, the detail of it, then you don't have context. Um, and I would try and encourage people to read. So a lot of it is more than, you know, as I said, I, I won't just name my children, but if you listen to that generation, you kind of saying, what was that about? It's it's almost like a shrug of the shoulders rather than th that was really something that Ireland went through that happened in Northern Ireland on the ground. And it, it, it lasted for decades. I mean, the songs is a very controversial one and very hurtful to some people. So I think if maybe if we were all a bit more mindful about even if it is a great tune, mm -hmm. sing something else. Why sing that one if it causes less upset? But I think there's not an understanding of that uh, because people weren't through. I mean, I have to choose all my words carefully as a commissioner in my job. And that is right that I do. I try to do the same in the parliament so that you don't unnecessarily offend somebody 
um, by a word or a deed that really will cause havoc. I think that certainly at that generation needs to understand it better. I mean, you can hear them say, oh, get over it. It's only a song. But actually, we all know that songs have meaning. Um, and there's I know that John used to sing cross um, community songs. Let's put it that way, including the sash. So at least he was, he was open to that. Um, but, but maybe just they need to be a bit more sensitive to it. Now, how that will happen, I really don't know, because, um, again, if you haven't gone through it. Um, and also, I think for, for even, you know, ourselves, not to ever downplay or forget where we've come from. I always worry about that, that we take things for granted and, you know, that we don't reflect on what it took, you know, in terms of the heavy lifting of men and women to deliver uh, a more peaceful uh, society um, on the island, but also that we're not finished because we don't have an assembly. Uh, we should have. Um, I mean, the people in Northern Ireland need that. I mean, I, I know that when Brexit, the vote happened, I think Sinn Féin had opted out, so there was no assembly sitting. And I had delegations from Northern Ireland come, knocking at my door in the parliament to say, look, can you just help us get to talk to somebody or can you help us deal with this? Because they didn't have... They felt they had no access to power or to influence. I thought that was a real shame. Uh, and I think what's happening now is a shame. And I would hope, I mean, we all hope that it can happen. And, and some suggest there are noises in that direction, but it's, it is it is needed, you know? You can't just sustain without having a, people need a voice. Yeah. You spoke very eloquently about, about John's gifts and I suppose my own sort of nutshell, uh, Appreciation would be the fact that he was able to articulate um, his sense of how to solve or address a problem that seemed intractable, and then he was able to persuade others of his analysis uh, to tremendous effect. I mean, if you think of the people he persuaded in, in the United States and uh, Britain and perhaps ultimately across the sectarian divide in Northern Ireland, um, he also took tremendous risks. Now, you talked about the talks with Jerry Adams and I remember I was a young reporter in Dublin at the time and the vitriol that he received for that. Um, I want to ask you about risk taking because that was a massive risk that he took. Um, do we take risks in politics these days because A, the political landscape is so much more fragmented and we're in a, a kind of a hyper surveillance uh, moment with um, with the way politics is covered and analysed, and then the the whole toxic effect of social media. I mean, could John Hume have done that in 2023? Is the question? No, actually, I don't think so, and I think that's troubling. I mean, I, I've often made the observation, not in the context of peace building, but generally for politicians, that I mean, you need a quiet moment, a few of them, and without a phone sometimes, even for your own head let alone when you're talking to somebody about a sensitive issue. And there are very few places where you can find that quiet place that isn't somebody watching or listening in. And even when you think you're not being watched, I mean, I've been shocked sometimes. People will chapter and verse say they saw me wherever with whomever. Um, usually it's nothing, you know, that you would be embarrassed about, but you kind of go, oh, gosh, so somebody was watching what I was doing. So I, I think to that point, it would be very difficult to do that today because it would not escape notice. Um, I think knowing John, he'd find a way because I think he was that. I, I think in a way, um, he just would. It would just happen because he wouldn't be put off. And a lot of what the peace process was, all the ingredients, they were well mapped out decades previously by John. I mean, he actually for slow learners. <laughs> indeed, had it. Yeah. But I suppose not everybody was up to speed with that. Um, and. Then he used every particular opportunity he had to make sure anyone he spoke to knew what he had in mind. And yet it was incredible how he was able to um, make his way through the US and get people engaged. And as I mentioned, the musicians already and in the European context as well. So, I mean, I suppose if maybe John was a man who just, he, he wouldn't, be offended if he said, would you ever stop and leave me alone? He'd keep at it. You know, that kind of way where some of us would pull back. But I think a lot of it was his personality. You would probably know that more than I would. But as I read about him, I think he had that, he had that kind of, I'm going in that direction. Well, I want to, I want to get there. I can't go on a straight line and I'm actually going to meander until I do get to where I need to be. And that's what it is. 
over a very, very long period of life. But it was rooted, and that's what I really like. I mean, for me, the credit union movement was about people who hadn't much getting access to something. And John, in his 20s, realised that and worked for it. I think his time in Manus and the formation potentially to be um, a priest and his engagement and his learning was also part of that. He brought it with him. Um, so the spiritual side of John Hume, I think, was very important. Maybe others in the room know more, but I, I mean, I think that was important to him. Um, and sometimes, you know, even in those of us who won't question sometimes our spiritual side, sometimes you need it because there isn't anything else. And I would say it stood to John in the very, very hard moments or when he was trying to comfort somebody who'd lost a loved one, uh, that he had a, a, the, the, the spiritual dimension, which seemed to be part of both uh, Pat and John's life to, to, to hold on to when all else failed. So I think there was lots of things about his personality that made him the right man at that time to deliver. Um, I don't think he'd want to be eulogised. I think he'd want to be regarded as a very human person. And I think he was that from his very early beings right through. And, and also for me that he came from so little. I mean, when you think they all lived in one room and then moved to a two room, I mean, good on him for having a vision um, that he could do that. There are many who, who never could see that, but he had that vision and clearly it came from his own parents. Um, so there was an awful lot of factors that if one or two of them hadn't clicked, you wouldn't have had the John Hume you have, but maybe divine inspiration delivers these people, maybe not in time, but over time um, and they can do the right thing. And again, going back to my conversations with some colleagues in the parliament, um, you know, they do remember him and his passion for just peace and peace. I kept saying it, I kept talking about it. Um, and eventually, you know, through difficult whoops and turns. And that's why I mentioned Momola in particular. I think personalities are hugely important to process. I thought it was interesting that um, John wasn't fond of Martin McGuinness, seemed to get on better with Jerry Adams. I would have felt it would have been the reverse, but I don't know why I'm saying that. So, so those kind of things fascinate me about his. Um, his risk taking, as you describe it, and he was really attacked for that. I know the Sunday Indo were particularly kind, and and I, they felt that very, you know, deeply. I think as a family, very hurtful because his heart was in the right place. He wasn't doing it for any gain. He he was doing it because he believed that the only way out of this very deep black hole was to talk to those that really you would rather avoid because of the violence. But you knew you had to reach out otherwise. Yeah, um, you mentioned Brexit and we've had a spotlight on Ireland from an EU level like uh, we would never have imagined. Um, and you, and you, you were very much uh, part of that process in, in the Parliament and then since then as, as a commissioner. Um, essentially, the Irish government's analysis of the risks to the Good Friday Agreement were largely absorbed and adopted by the European Commission negotiator Michel Barnier and member states unanimously almost uh, backed that analysis and um, ensured that Ireland's concerns were, were, were dealt with. Um, since the protocol was negotiated and then subsequently the Windsor framework, I detect that there there are now those who are were part of the process who are thinking that perhaps they didn't take account of unionist concerns enough. They didn't understand just how viscerally this offended um, unionist sensibilities, no, no matter who was responsible for the Brexit vote and who had properly mapped out the consequences. I mean, do you think there's a case to answer there? Um, I think I haven't thought about that, but I think the way you put it, there's probably a case. And I think a lot of our, I mean, everything about politics and is, is emotionally driven, even though we also use intellect. But I think the referendum was such a sundering uh, issue. I think Enda Kenny really tried to persuade uh, UK that, look, this has implications for Northern Ireland. Um, I suppose for people who called for um, you know, to leave. So the unions community would have, not all, but many voted to leave. Um, there was a sense in which, well, you you knew what was going to be the outcome and, and you still went down that path. So maybe when you look back, could we have handled it? 
I'm not so sure anything would have been different, Tony, because I think there was also on those on the Brexit side vitriol about we're out, we're going, we're deregulating, we're moving away, we don't need you. So I think both of us needed to find a calm spot, which took us a while, frankly, um, to do that. And I, I would say that myself, because part of it was, I mean, because I knew the impact it would have on the island of Ireland, but I also knew the impact it would have on the European Parliament. Um, and it has had an impact because we had very good um, colleagues uh, from... Uh, Northern Ireland and, and, and Britain in the park. I wouldn't have agreed with all of them, but there were very good colleagues to have there. They also helped, I think, in terms of the Irish issues. Um, and they're gone, uh, completely gone and unlikely to, to return anytime soon. So I suppose what happened really when you think 2016 and this is 2023, it took time, and maybe that's part of what John saw as well. It took time for us to um maybe have have um, rebuild respect for each other and understand each other's positions without kind of getting shirty about it uh, or defensive about it. I think on the, the negotiations on the protocol, because there were certain leaders in the United Kingdom and they haven't gone away, you know, but they're earning a fortune, the they're, they're earning a fortune in, in other lives now. I think that did help. You know, I think the personality of some of the leaders really did the opposite. So they agreed one thing and then they said something else. So you, you were dealing with a very moving, I would say feast, not at all, a, a moving famine of, of ideas uh, and delivery. I think then Maros Shevkovic, you know, his role was huge. I think Maros is an incredible diplomat. Um, I, I see the way he can work and bring people with him. So I think that, you know, he's helped enormously building on the work of Michel Barnier. I suppose the big issue now is will we move on and forget that it's still it's still there? It still has frictions. Um, it's still impacting maybe in terms of relationships in Northern Ireland. Um, and there's so many other things on our agenda that it, it could happen that it becomes not not important anymore. It is important for me um, and I think for others, but but it probably um, and it surprises, I think, sometimes colleagues in the UK that it's not an issue at all internally in the Commission in the sense of day to day. It really doesn't. I mean, you would have reported on it by my, every moment because it was such a huge issue. But it's as you would probably see now, it's. Yeah, we're, we're no longer the centre of attention, which Absolutely. is a terribly sad place to be. <laughs> no, just on that, make just two points if I can make. I mean, I hope that Ireland, you know, ex really reflected on that. We did get a lot of attention for our own good, that there was huge support for us. That when you had MEPs from other member states standing up and verbalising the Irish issue, that to me was Europe in action. That's what we need more of, that we don't go in with our own flag somewhere hidden, but certainly with your view on all issues, that we go in and have a bit more European approach to legislation and to problem solving. Um, and I hope that that is reflected in, you know, in, in elections, but also in how people think about our role and our place in Europe. We're not there just to be poor, unfortunate Irish again coming with problem, but rather we articulated an issue. It was accepted as a valid one by our colleagues and they helped us with it in our discussions, in their, in the European discussions with the United Kingdom. Um, and I'm forever saying to people, you know, so the EU, and you kind of go, no, it's us, that's us, like, it's not them and us, we're in it. It's, it's sometimes you just have to pull people back from, from the, the language we used around it. And we could be tested in the future. If, if somebody else, some other member state has a difficulty and it doesn't suit us, will we be as willing? You know, I yeah. think that's a big open question. Okay, uh, talking of questions, I uh, would like to open we're out of questions. Um, if anyone would like to ask Mairead uh, anything about her reflection on John Hume or any other subject, uh, we can take questions from brave individuals. Yes. Yeah. Okay, Roy, my name. Um, Commissioner Megan, thank you very much. It's an excellent uh, discussion this evening so far. I, I think one of the two words that come to mind about John Hume's leadership for me, anyway, are tenacity and resilience. Uh, I think they're the kind of, you know, you talked about courage and the courage, of course, caused the tenacity and caused the resilience. And, you know, when you look back over the to the 1970s, you see time and again that he had to kind of come back to the table. 
And I suppose what I'd like you to do is reflect on tenacity and resilience in politics today. Um, and and are they, are they they're not values, what are they? I suppose they're, they're characteristics. And, and I suppose, are they important in your leadership um, as a commissioner? Um, are they important for us in the current geopolitical situation? Um, I think my view is that they are, but I'd, I'd love to hear your reflections on them. I think I'll, I'd qualify, but I think you're right about tenacity and uh, resilience. I think John was very troubled a lot of the time. That's my sense of it because of what he was trying to do. Um, and his health suffered, his physical health. And I know he, if you asked him, how are you? He, he would tell you how he was, but he had a lot of related stress. So I think if he had um, resilience, it was a very troubled resilience because it did impact his health and well-being a lot. And he did suffer for that. I think on the wider point of resilience, um, and I often think when I talk to schools, because I think there is a huge vulnerability now, particularly post-COVID, I, I sense that amongst young people. Um, and I was in a school at, on Friday, my, the school actually where I read the opening address 50 years ago next year, but anyway, they still remember me. Um, but it was interesting. I was talking about like, there was how do you make decisions and how do you feel when somebody kind of attacks you? The first time it happens, it's pretty awful because we're human beings first. Um, so I think when I ran for election, I'd say I wasn't as resilient as I am today, but I'm much more of a recluse today. And I say that in a good way, in the sense that what I've discovered, and I was a great talker, I'm probably overdoing it tonight, apologies. But I find myself being very quiet now. I find myself kind of retreating to places like the yard with the sweeping brush in the rain to kind of get that sense of grounding. Um, that's how I do it, because I think if you didn't, I think if you're in politics and you keep in that, I think it's very difficult mentally to cope with all of that. So resilience is hugely important. And I don't know how we build it in young people because I, I worry about their resilience. Um, I also worry that we burden them with climate change and they're all anxious about it. We've done great harm to the younger generation on these topics. And we shouldn't do it. I, I just really bothers me that that happens. Um, on tenacity, I mean, it's a, it's it's a version of the same thing. I don't know if he was. I would have put tenacity with John. I just think he had a, I think a great faith. He had a faith in that what he was doing was the right thing. That leading a peaceful um, protest for civil and human rights was the right thing to do. And he's absolutely right. Of course, it was. Um, you know when he. You know, that um, on the beach where he confronted or the soldier confronted him. I mean, he was being very dignified um, because of his conviction that this was the right thing to do. But he would never have gone towards violence to achieve his ends. And that's where he differed completely from those that he had and did talk to. He knew there was another way um, and he, he lived that other way and he was going to keep going for as long as it took. So, yeah, I think resilience, I don't know how others feel in the room about resilience, but I think all of us are under much more pressure um, and we have to build on resilience. And I would often say in school, sometimes what you need is an invisible shield. I mean, people will come up and say the most incredible things to you. I mean, I remember being on the lake late talking about Brexit of all things, and I got an email from a man, thankfully I didn't bump into him, to say that my eyelids were drooping. <laughs> and I got a lot of issues on actually. Fixed. <laughs> which you're meant to say not at all, Ray. Really, you know, looked like it 20 years ago. <laughs> so you kind of go and you imagine doing that. I mean, it's like who would do it, you know? <laughs> I don't know what, what way they were brought up, but there is much more like we can say things to you because we see you and we know you. Um, and I think people in political life have to live with that. John, you know, was handed a comb on a few occasions for his hair, which I think is kind of, I kind of like that, that he sort of had this kind of whatever, um, and that he might have needed somebody to tie his shoes. I love that human dimension to him. I think it was part of his parcel. He wasn't perfect at all, either in his, you know, physical turnout sometimes, uh, or indeed his, his effort, but his heart, I mean, that to me was the key thing, that his heart was very much in the right place. I think tenacity, if you're full of it, mightn't always be the right gift. Um, but I do worry about like when I see my uh, family, I mean, would any of them ever do what I did politically? If you'd ask them, 
No, I mean, not they, they think it's mad and they wonder how you cope with having to deal with uh, difficult situations. And I suppose the only way I deal with them, and there's been, I think it can be very tough at times, is avoid social media. Don't read something after you've given a speech that you know people will take issue with. Um, and you have the power to do that. Like we need, somebody said, to take back control. I think the biggest thing we need to take back control of is ourselves. Like you don't have to subject yourself to the view of a total stranger who doesn't know you at all. And you don't have to let that impact your next action. So I'm much better at dealing with that. I wonder how John would have dealt with it, because I actually think he was very hurt by so many articles that were written. Um, but they weren't followed up by attacks on social media or ugly remarks or fake news or all of that thing. So I think he would have he would have had the very same hurt, but deeper than what he dealt with in traditional media, um, because it takes a very brave person to swim against the tide of opinion, because you can see what none of the rest of us could, that there was a solution. And that you were going to keep talking about that solution until people gave in. So almost they had they just realized actually he's talking sense. And he drew people together around him. And that politics in the United Kingdom also helped at the time. The right people were in power to support the process. So I often wonder what would have happened if none of those things had all those ducks weren't in a line. Probably it wouldn't have. Um, happened. We wouldn't be talking about 25 years of peace. I don't know what we would be talking about, but uh, by God, I'm glad that it that we can look back and reflect on. Any other Yes, Richard. Yeah, I, my name is Richard Corbett. I used to be the leader of the UK Labour Party MEPs in the European Parliament. But I met John for the first time. I served with him, of course, but for the first time well before I was elected when I was just were trying to work it out. I was only 24 and I went and stayed with John and Pat in February 1980. And we went over to Donegal to the Pillibeg's fishing festival. Healy's. Healy's restaurant. No, we went to the restaurant. First we went out on a boat and so on, but then there was a festival on the square. And then that might, that might have been the restaurant. John was asked by the organizers to be the judge of a fancy dress competition. Poisoned <laughs> <laughs> chalice for any politician. Yes, you, yeah. know, you give one winner and you've alienated everybody else. Not John. He gave a prize for the best dressed, the most original, the most innovative. <laughs> and in the end, everybody got the prize. And I said to him afterwards, that was really clever. You're a you know, tricky politician. And he said, no, 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 no. This is about making everybody realize they had a contribution to make. They had a stake. They could be a winner. All of us together, not just one winner that takes it all. That's a great story. I thought it was a, it was a great, uh, great story. It's also a great story, Richard, is that you were in Northern Ireland and you were with him. I was really sometimes embarrassed when I had colleagues in the parliament from other member states who would have helped in in communities in Northern Ireland when we were sitting back, not doing it. So I think there was a lot of European engagement um, in Northern Ireland and, and your engagement was obviously key as well. That was well before I was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I just had a second little anecdote. In the European Parliament in the the evenings when you're in Strasbourg, nobody lives in Strasbourg, so you're away from home, hotels, etc. So what happens? You go out in the evenings, Magella will know this, <laughs> you go out for a drink and so on. There was a place, a little bar, which everyone called Bang the Bells, because you had to ring the bell to get in. And in about 11 in the evening and 2 in the morning, it was full of Irish members of Parliament from every political party and socialists from every member state. One was the intersection, socialist group. <laughs> and that's when he used, apart from this power of talking to people and convincing them, but his voice, you mentioned his singing. I think Bunch of Time was his favorite song, actually. But that power of bringing people together in a different context, but 
we weren't discussing politics, but you suddenly felt a community of being together. That was also a very powerful tool that he used. I think that's absolutely true. That's why I mentioned the singing. It's really, it struck a chord. I mean, I actually think it is a way of, I suppose it lifts people to another level and kind of brings them together. I have a story about judging uh, once. I made a big mistake. I avoided the bonny baby. <laughs> I accepted the best dressed man. <laughs> ever, ever. <laughs> And he told me she didn't want. Gracious me, he's the only. <laughs> His name was McGinnis, and I don't like him. I thought, fortunately, that never again. But if I were to you again, I'd be John Hewitt. That was really. Wasn't it his philosophy? How many? Or how did he get prizes for all of them? Fish each or something? Because you didn't want. <laughs> Everybody. <laughs> Any other observations or questions for the Dan, this is this is pure uh, vanity for me, but you mentioned Bono yeah. and obviously the concert 25 years ago with you, Bono and Tremolai played a small part in organizing that. And it was a really important moment in terms of facing I won't talk about that. In October, John was announced that he was winning the Nobel Peace Prize, and there was a dinner, an FLP dinner in Dublin. Um, and I rang Bono to say, "Will he come out to congratulate John on the Nobel Peace Prize?" Bono couldn't come, and said, "Would John, Pat, and myself go to Kalani where Bono lives on the Sunday for brunch?" And I didn't know where he went, but actually, I had to borrow a car. We went out to Kalani. I didn't know where he lived, and that's another story. But we we got to the gates. Of Bono's house, um, Bono said the one three times. There were like forty or fifty French students. Yeah. Just remember that, everybody. If you want to go and visit Bono, three, just, three times. Three suits, you know, <laughs> there was forty or fifty French students outside. John winds down the window and gives them the thumbs up as we go through the gate. <laughs> and he turns to me. He says, "How did they know I was coming?" <laughs> <laughs> and then we go inside. Not sure. I feel that she was holding court with some amazing people. But then an hour into it, Bottom said to him, says, and this is the generosity of John. Um, John, nobody deserved the Nobel Peace Prize more than you. And I was concerned that John wasn't well and he wouldn't know what to say. But he gets up and he says to Bono, and he says, see you and your bands and other pop bands in the world. They don't know anything. Their heads are in the clouds. <laughs> Where is this going? Yeah. He says, well, see you, Bono, and your band. You're different. Oh, wow. John Hume didn't win the Good Friday Agreement. David Trimble didn't win the Good Friday Agreement. You won the Good Friday Agreement. But you brought young people out to that concert to say yes. They couldn't vote, but they told their parents and friends to vote yes. You won the good friend. And for once, Bono was silenced. I was reading the detail of that. And it's, it's, it's very funny. Yeah. But it, I, I'm glad he had an ego. You know, I think it's part of all of us to have an ego. Uh, now, he kind of flattened it for a few times as well as raised. And I suppose the big issue um, was, you know, did then the SDLP you know, suffer because of uh, the delivery of peace. We've all these conversations about the what ifs, um, but I suppose the prize was the prize. And, and I, I think we can ever forget that part of it. But I love that story. OK, any other observations or yes, sir? Uh, yes, uh, my name is Casper McPhee. I uh, represent EBCAM. Um, thank you first and foremost for your uh, lovely talk that you've given this evening. Um, I'd love to start with an anecdote about uh, John. I don't have one, but it would be a dry question. Uh, my question is about the role of uh, Europe as an ambassador uh, um, of peace around the world, which we see particularly now um, in the Israel-Gaza conflict. And I was wondering if you could uh, give us sort of your views on that, particularly with regards to the backlash that um, Ursula von der Leyen has received perceived one -sided Yeah, I referenced it briefly. Um, so, so I'll just add a few remarks around that. I mean, I think the horror of what happened on October the 7th was so severe um, that all of us were horrified by the terrorist attack. You are, we're terrorists generally. 
Um, I think the president and subsequently has articulated that we need to listen to Israel. I think that's a fair point. Uh, but I think that in the beginning, it was um, not as clear as it is today, where we're saying you know, Israel also needs to apply uh, international and humanitarian law. I think it is significant that there hasn't been a, an invasion. I mean, there's bombardment. I'm not saying that's the right thing, but so so I, I'm wondering, and I'm not part of the detail, but if you look at all the leaders who are going out now to Israel, I think there's a real sense, and this is why I'm, I'm being very careful rightly about my words. I think there's a real sense that this is something which could go much bigger and much worse. It's already really bad. Um, so I, I sense that leaders are reaching out to Israel to deliver this message of both solidarity and, you know, what is required in law, uh, international and humanitarian law. Um, so there was in the beginning, people could see frictions. It's interesting that Ireland has, uh, I suppose, if you go one side or the other, certainly the, the view would be more pro-Palestinian. Um, we had a protest outside the Dublin office, very peaceful, and you know, there was a meeting afterwards. Um, and I, I would hope that when the leaders meet again, that they, and that's Thursday, so that I think that, you know, they their statement was very clear, short and clear. Uh, and I presume there will be another discussion on this, which should also be very clear and short. Um, I mean, no horror is compared with another. And I think that's the difficulty. So I was horrified when I saw what happened at the music festival or the idea that children were taken hostage or, uh, you know, blood all over the place. I found it very difficult to watch those on, on just traditional media because social media, I, I can't be dealing with it because you don't know what's true or false. Um, but I'm equally as horrified by what I see in Gaza. You know, if it is true that one part of the housing is now destroyed, um, there's 20 trucks going in. This is all good, but we also need fuel to get in so that the hospitals can continue. So it's 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 been you know you could see the different views across the 27 member states. That's not unusual. I think with Russia's invasion of Ukraine, it was clearer. But I think in this, it's it's been slightly uh, more nuanced. But you know, terror is out. Terrorism. Hamas is a terrorist organization. The, the issue is then what role for Iran? Where is Iran in all of this? Um, Equally, I mean, Hamas is just creating And I think that's where we're all trying to manage the provocation so that Israel feels it can defend itself. Uh, but it also listens to what President Biden said, which was don't do what we did after 9-11, where we made mistakes because of the emotion of the situation. Now, it's very easy for us in the, this room to say that, but I, I was happy that somebody like the President of the United States said that so clearly because it's reflected that he understood their pain and their anger and all of the emotion which is, and will be there for some time, but also wanted that Israel would not, if you like, do things that it would come to regret in time. I think for me, Europe has a huge role to play in this um, because we're a peace project, but we've moved back decades. That's what I'm worried about, like, you know, and maybe there was we needed to pay more attention to that region than was given to it. And sometimes there are so many fires that we're trying to deal with as a European Union that it can be we all give out about the commission or whatever that you're not doing enough. but. And I was one of the biggest critics of the commission in yonder house, in the parliament. I now realize that the commission sometimes is caught between the rock and the hard place. Um, so I think that Ursula von der Leyen's motivations were, were, were good. I mean, it was motivated because she went there in solidarity. But I did have a question from a young student in the school I visited about the, the Israeli flag and things like that. So uh, rather than inflame or say wrong or right, I try and 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 say, look, I, I understand the motivation um, and clearly what we're all trying to do is to make sure that this doesn't escalate to even worse horror than is already happening in both Israel and in Gaza and that we can try and rise above it. See, we say very glibly a two state solution. When and how is that going to happen? Um, and equally, if Hamas not just wants to wipe out Jewish community, but but Christians and, and whatever, if that is their motivation, then we all are in trouble. 
Um, so how do you deal with hatred and division at a very visceral level uh, that comes out in, in a terrorist organization? Um, you would worry that it would spread. And I think there's a concern internally in Europe that it could have impacts. So I, I don't deny your, the core of your question, but I hope I've reflected that this um, initial reaction is also tempered by moderate language. I would imagine, though, there are private conversations. And this I go back to my point about sometimes things should not, or it's not appropriate at a given time to say something in public. But it's very appropriate that you say things in private. And I'd say a lot of things have and are being said in private. And I would hope just finally that the council, uh, which includes Taoiseach, um, will reflect broadly the position that it has um, enunciated today, even given the fact that in the Doyle last week, this last week there was a debate which was very clearly um, expressing some anger um, with the Israeli approach. And I, it's a pity in any situation that if you're regarded as being pro something, you're anti the other side, which is not the case. And I think this is the eggshells that I walk on uh, as being a commissioner. Um, that in fact, I, I, I'm, I'm saddened that we have this at all. And that we, it, the least we can do is abide by laws that govern war, which you would, you know, even in war, there are rules, notwithstanding the pain that Israel has gone through. I mean, there's wider issues about the politics in Israel and other things um, and settlements and whatever. And at some point, this will have to be dealt with. And I, I, I think we don't know how, when and where that will happen. But maybe our reflections on, on John would help us to, to get there. It has to happen. Otherwise, the world is in flames. I mean, truthfully, and I mean, I know one of some of the younger audience when I mentioned climate. I mean, wars really have a bad effect on our climate. You know, and we're trying to do all sorts of things to address environment and, all, and biodiversity loss and climate and wars really pull us all back into a, a very bad place. So, you know, this commission has dealt with a lot of things. Um, I think this is a big test for us as the war in Ukraine was, as COVID was. Um, but if any, if Brexit taught us anything was that if we don't hang together, you know, it's, it's over. Um, and that's why I make the point about progress. It isn't a given that we will hold together either. And it only will hold together in a way the European Parliament, I think, has a particularly important role. Um, because it's not mithered by the day to day of a national, of a member state. It's, it has a bigger view. And I hope it maintains that, um, not just in this mandate, but in the next. Just a final question, uh, observation, Commissioner um, Richard Haas, who was a, a special envoy from the US to Northern Ireland, was writing in Foreign Affairs magazine just last week. and about the the Middle East and he actually said that Israel would do well to take the example of Northern Ireland in the 1980s and 90s where I mean he was ascribing the progress in a sense to the British government having this policy of a security strategy in the one hand um, but also a political strategy in opening up talks with um, the IRA's representatives and that's really what Israel should be doing. Um, I, I don't think it's a, a fanciful parallel, but it's an interesting one all the same um, because there are very few good options open to the Israeli government at the moment. And as you say, the one thing they don't want to do is to make things worse. Yeah, I think your last comment I'd agree with. There are very few good options. I mean, the th situation at the moment is really very frightening. Um, I think for the entire world, it's not just there, it's, it's, it will affect us all. Um, I'm always loath to say, yeah, you can compare Northern Ireland with what's happening there, but you can compare division and conflict, which existed. You also, the roots of anger and the roots of, you know, inequality and those things, yes. But how close are we to um, his vision happening? We're more than 25 years away, in my view, and I say that with enormous regret. I mean, I would hope that we would find a way. But if I listen to... Um, commentary from Israel. I don't get a sense that there is any intention other than military way. And I think what we're all concerned about is, and what happens after that? Because there will be an after that at some point. Um, and can we, I mean, we're very bloody complicated as human beings. I mean, really, when you think about how we navigate and negotiate, 
But I'd hope that Europe would at least be able to our channels, our diplomatic work. We have um, the HRVP. Um, I'd hope uh, we would be able to help um, without kind of saying you're on their side or it, this idea of you're either with me or you're against me. Sometimes being against you has actually been with you because you're you're trying to rest people from, from maybe the worst endeavours. So certainly part of it, there's an analogy there because there's a conflict um, and there's hope the Palestinians want their home as much as Israel wants their home. So you'd imagine if that was the objective, you just have to find a way of, of doing it. But all of this goes back much further than the now. It's the origins of this conflict. So I hope I'm wrong about that we're very far away. Um, I'm not a student of the Middle East. I, I'm really trying to become much more aware of the, the nuances. Um, but I think the divisions are very deep. You know, that's that's where I worry that um, now that we're very deep in Northern Ireland, mm -hmm. I suppose, you know, I'm maybe turning back to say maybe there is more to it than than, than I am suggesting. And maybe, John, wherever you are, would bring that spirit of peace into the hearts and minds of some. And I, I mentioned women. I think that's really important. Um, so maybe, maybe mm -hmm. I have a duty of hope. Yeah, Tony, I go from the sense so that. Yeah, I think in a sense that we all remember the Grey Steel killings in that sense that things are really at their worst. And it was perhaps the darkest hour before the, before the dawn. Yeah. yeah, well, let's hope. And those of you who pray, say one. Yeah, well, it's it's been a tremendous uh, honour for me to moderate the uh, John Hume European Spirit of Peace, the third John Hume Spirit of Peace. Uh, lecture, and it's been a tremendous pleasure to welcome and to interview Maria McGuinness, Ireland's Commissioner. And if anyone has any yards that need to be cleaned up, um, service in West Kirk Church and Shagal Road for sorry about with Joe Hendren, the former MP to West Mavast, who went to the Shagal Road the day after that and they were very appreciative. And that was a dark week, as you would remember, Tony and many others. I think in 14 days we lost 24 lives at that period. And obviously you mentioned the tears. I think one moment can change things. And the moment the funeral and grave steel where John was broken because of the criticism by his opponents, the media, nine articles in one day in the Sunday Independent, and even Pat Hume had doubts after, after Shanghai bombing. And the, the, the daughter of one of the victims said, went over to John and said, uh, at the wake last night, we prayed over with Alice Coffin that you continue to bring last in peace. And John broke down, but I think those words were the moment that we pulled back from the brink and John's work could continue and see his thousands of lives. So I think that's, that's sort of argument. Can I thank um, Tony for your chairing? Can I thank IBAC Global, Jackie King, Jose and all the staff who have been very, very helpful uh, in organising this event. Can I thank Maria's staff again for working with us on this project? I can specifically thank you, Maria, for the universe. I know that Pat Hume was here, she would have with that. And I know some of the children are watching around the world and they would have been very, very grateful for your wonderful and first. And this is a very clever, do you know, very clever in Derry. The, yes, uh, indeed, yeah. So yeah. this is a small token. It's a local artist in Derry who's created these. Thank you very much. It's a beautiful thing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Right <laughs> now. <laughs> 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 Very good at it. <laughs> 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 the drinking. <laughs>
Yeah, put it easy, you know.